about the origins of the universe. Space isn't remote at all. It's only an hour's drive away if your car could go straight upwards. Sir Fred Hoyle, the sometimes controversial English astronomer, said this in 1979. Hoyle suffered the effects of gravity on this planet from 1915 to 2001. He spent all that time not believing in the theory of the Big Bang. A sweetly ironic fact because it was Hoyle who gave the theory its very name while mocking its existence on BBC Radio in 1949. Hoyle insisted that the universe was like a river, all the parts of it moving and changing constantly, but essentially staying the same. If one part of it should become vacant, like scooping your hand into the water and lifting it up, then the rest of the river, or matter, would swell into the void. Fred Hoyle also said, things are the way they are, because they were the way they were. Things are different at night. The sun is such an attention seeker and only in the absence of a slope, soul of flamboyance can the night flowers of curiosity bloom. The infinite black ceiling above reveals so much more about our collective history than it hides below. The daylight might lift your spirits but the night sky reveals the dusty footprint of every thought you've ever had. That everybody has ever had. I stand in the vacant lot next to my house, next to the railway line. It's midnight where I am. The sky is as naked as the day it was born. My dreams are 13 billion years old and tonight I feel like going for a drive. I want to go where the stars match my eyes. When things were younger, denser and warmer. I want to go on a drive to the Big Bang with Sir Fred Hoyle. The car, an E.H. Holden, sits on its end pointing straight upwards towards the moon and beyond. Fred comes walking across the vacant lot holding a stepladder. I love it when my dreams are punctual and well prepared. I help him onto the ladder. It's not easy getting into a car at a vertical angle. But then neither is imagining a time when there was no time. When there was less than nothing. That's because time as we know it today didn't exist. It was a different order of things, says Fred. It's like trying to understand a thought you've never had. I thought you didn't believe in the Big Bang Theory, I say. Well, I don't see the logic of rejecting data just because it doesn't make sense, says Fred. Once he's in the passenger seat, he pulls me in so I can climb up on the windscreen to the driver's side and slide in the window, Dukes of Hazard style. I look over to Fred. Why can't I drive, he says. Because you've been dead for eight years, I say while putting the key into the ignition. The car starts first time. I adjust the mirrors out of habit, but all I can see means dirt. I don't know what I expect to see up there. I ease under the accelerator and we're off. Soon in my mirrors I see first my house and the railway line next to it, then the state, then the country, than the planet. An hour later, we're in space, just like Fred said we would be. Light is a teacher of history. We've learned so much about how old the stars are by the shifting colours in the spectrums that adjust to the ever-expanding galaxies. I look over to the back seat and there are two wooden oars sitting there. I look back to Fred. Just in case, he says. Do you 
universe hasn't always been clear. For 300,000 years after the so-called Big Bang, there was a thick particle soup that was more opaque. That's what we're looking for. Evidence. But Fred is also looking for something else because there's something deeply troubling, Sir Fred Hoyle. The chances of life randomly being created on Earth just doesn't stick with him. I look out the window and I see what I feel. The twinkling black sheet of infinity. River deep, mountain high. There is a simpleness to beginnings that wipe clear the slate of your mind when all the details are strained to a single tiny point. There was no explosion at all, but the first letter of the most beautiful sentence ever written. The planets of our solar system pass us by. Fred points them out one by one and tries to build his case for the absurdity of chemical evolution. See that planet, he says? It's entirely populated by the blind. Every member was given a Rubik's Cube and they all solved it simultaneously. Then he points out the other window. On that planet over there, a man was given a die and he threw 50,000 sixes in a row. And in the time that we left Earth, a tornado passed over a junkyard containing all the parts to a Boeing 747 and left the plane fully assembled in its wake. All of these things, he says, have the same chance of happening as the blind forces of the primal sea putting together the raw cosmic jigsaw of enzymes that eventually rolled out of the sea and into us. I look to Fred and he gazes painfully out of the car window. He wants more than he's given. I feel for him. A scientist whose numbers finally added up to zero. An enormous guiding hand covered in zeros. There is a coherent plan in the universe, he insists. I just don't know what it's a plan for, he says sadly. Mouths his head. I turn on the radio to see if God FM is broadcasting. Give us some kind of explanation, but all we can hear is static. It's so hard to dance to. What Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson did, they tuned into the same station in 1965. The scientists who first discovered the background radiation that is everywhere, all the time, even inside your TV set. So ringing in your ears left over from the concert of creation. But who was the promoter? The sound of the static fills the car. The more we drive, the louder it gets. I reach over to kill the radio, but Fred touches me on the hand and says, no, let it speak. If we keep listening, it's bound to say something we can understand. Eventually. The static washes through our hair, our clothes, our very bones until we're completely dusted with electric snow. In my rear view mirror, I can see the past, the future, and the present all equally in love with me at the same time. Now, then,